Well, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us again in this week's lunch talk. Uh, this uh, today we have the honor of being uh, of having as lecturer Professor Pedro Martinez Praga. I'm sure all of you joining us today know pretty well who we're talking about here. He is a very renowned arbitrator, practitioner, and professor. And just to say a few words, a Professor Martinez Saga is a World Bank arbitrator. And in 2015, President Barack Obama appointed him as one of the four members uh, of the panel of conciliators in front of ICSID becoming actually the first Hispanic to have been appointed in this position since the creation, since uh, the ratification of the ICSID Convention of 1965. So that, I think, is a good example and reflection of how great his influence in this arbitral system and in the market has been throughout his years. He has written um, many books that I am sure you have at least read some of them, and I know you have been able to witness its influence in how this market is being shaped and how arbitral law is being shaped. And finally, uh, he, uh, Professor Martinez Plaga, besides being a very well-known professor, he is actually uh, has been a professor at NYU for many years. He is also the co-leader of the Arbit International Arbitration Practice in Brian K. Layton Lindner, LLP. He is based now in Miami, which is from where he is going to be delivering this talk today. And, well, I think I've had the honor of having him as professor, and I just hope you can enjoy some of his amazing charisma in today's lunch talk. And finally, he, he has honored us with discussing what I consider to be an amazing topic, which is the judicial immunity influence in arbitral immunity, what it does right, what it does wrong. We, we will discuss that with Professor Martinez Praga today. And at the end, please do not hesitate to raise your hand if you have any questions or even share your comments or questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Without further ado, Professor Martinez, thank you very much. Thank you, Astrid. That is a, that is a tremendously generous introduction that I, I hope to live up to at least 10% of it. But thank you so much. It's really a privilege to be here. I was telling Astrid before I got on mine that uh, I just finished two arbitrations back to back and I have, um, one of them was an investor state arbitration. I have another one. Uh, starting on December 3rd. So it's, it's a real privilege to be here and to be with you. Uh, the title of this lecture is The King Can Do No Wrong, The Pernicious Effect of Judicial Immunity on Arbitral Immunity. And that's the title. And the title comes from a chapter in, in a book that I just republished in its second edition by Cambridge University Press in July. And, um, and, but this subject matter will be the subject matter of a book that will come out with, um, that Oxford University Press is going to put out next year. So it's, it's really great to take a break from the actual practice of law and the, the dynamics of that, to, to think about ideas with you that are of common and, and mutual interest and concern. So here's why um, I think, first of all, this topic was picked by, by Astrid, by, by you guys, but it was one of a list of topics that I proposed and the reason why I placed it as an important topic is because I really believe that enough thought is not accorded to the role of the arbitrators in international arbitration. What I'm trying to say is that the arbitrator who is so central to this process, in fact, I share with you, there is no deed, act, exercise of judgment in an international arbitration of greater consequence than the selection of that arbitral panel. There is absolutely nothing that you can do that will be of greater consequence. But I really do feel that not enough has been done or is being done in terms of thinking about the arbitral process from the lenses of the law and ethics and principles that surround the actual arbitral panel. 
Uh, let me just tell you a, a couple of things that I think are, are extremely important. Uh, as you know, arbitrators have more discretion and more inherent powers than any, any rule maker, decision maker, adjudicator, if you will, in the history of mankind in practically any field except for a monarch. And we're going to talk a little bit about that also in this lecture. Uh, this vast discretion, if you look at any of the rules, DIS, uh, Deutsche Institut, uh, the ICDR, the ICC, any of the, the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, any, any of, the, of the rules, you'll see that most rules on most foundational issues will say subject to the party's agreement, comma, the arbitral tribunal may dot, dot, dot. Now, let me share something with you. Once you're in an arbitration, there's very little party agreement. That's why you're in the arbitration. There's a dispute, and chances are that uh, the dispute is an extremely meaningful one. That's why you're in, in that context uh, in the first place. So the issue that I want to bring to your attention is the divide that we have conceptually between civil law jurisdictions, um, jurisdictions in the Middle East, jurisdictions in Asia, and common law jurisdictions on arbitrator immunity. And what I would like to tell you uh, at, at the outset is that there is no single pronouncement that can be made as to the scope of arbitrator immunity in any of these systems. All of these systems have some sort of exception to the general rule, but there are general rules that are very discernible that provide a divide in between the systems. So you, and I'm going to mainly focus on civil law and common law. In the civil law uh, system, generally, a good example, uh, and generally, uh, you find that arbitrator immunity uh, really does not exist. There, there's very little, and what little there is is extremely qualified. In some jurisdictions, like the Middle East, for example, there's almost a strict liability standard so that anything that an arbitrator does wrong is presumably uh, gives rise to liability per se uh, without a need for real proof beyond just damages. Uh, this is a very serious type of, of, of situation. But what we find uh, most notable and, and most prevalent in non-common law systems is a situation where the arbitral tribunal uh, or the arbitrator is judged or held accountable based on a contractual theory of law. Now, what does this really mean? Well, this is what it means. And I, I wanted to share with you the example of Argentina. Uh, now, uh, for you who are Argentine out there, uh, I love Argentina, I think it's a great country, uh, but Argentina has, has had the dubious distinction of really contributing to arbitral case law, particularly I use case law loosely, but particularly in the field of investor state arbitration. Uh, as you know, our Argentina has been a, a party respondent in, I think, 20 uh, investor state arbitrations. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it, it holds a very, very special place. But Argentina also is, in some sense, emblematic of what I have identified as a bipolarity in civil code or civil law jurisdictions. What is this bipolarity? It's simple. The first part of the bipolarity is that if you read the uh, code of uh, the civil code, civil and commercial code of, of Argentina, for example, you will find that it will identify uh, arbitrators as being liable for damages. Uh, in other words, an arbitrator is treated as a provider of services in the market. The arbitrator accepts an appointment. The, 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 uh, the verbiage of, of contract law pervades the entire uh, commercial civil code uh, completely. So you find on, uh, on, one, in, in one, in one, on one hand, you find that the arbitrator has a type of a civil liability um, that is that is fairly reasonable because it's it's the civil liability of a commercial actor. This means that the arbitrator is not seen at all as an adjudicator. But then you turn to their penal code, 
and you discover that the arbitrator is, is held to the same standard as a judge, as a public actor. So on, on, on one side, you have arbitrator, uh, commercial, private actor. Uh, on another side, a very important side, the, the criminal side, the penal side, you have the arbitrator as a public actor, a, a public functionary, someone very much akin to a judge. So this, this is a very, very stark and interesting model. Now, I wanna be very clear with you. Uh, the Argentine example is not the most emblematic example of what actually is the state of affairs in civil code or civil law jurisdictions. It's, it's an emblematic, uh, a, a paradigmatic example of the bipolarity where you have two paradigms, the private actor and the public actor. The seller of professional services in the form of arbitral services, arbitral needs, adjudicator in that sense, and, and then on the other side, a type of quasi-judicial role, a public actor. Uh, so the, Argentina does bring this dichotomy in, into play. Now, where do we stand in the common law world and in the United States in particular? I think in a very, very bad place, in my opinion. Uh, and of course, I'm very interested in, in hearing and learning about your opinion, uh, your various opinions. And the reason is, in, in the U.S., uh, what we follow is a, a judge or judicial adjudicator model to international arbitration and arbitrator liability, a judicial model. And this is a judicial model that provides arbitrators, cloaks arbitrators with almost absolute immunity. Almost absolute immunity. I dare say that the model uh, is premised on the British uh, thinking, uh, the English thinking on the subject before the 1996 Arbitration Act. I'll talk to you about that in a second, and we'll explore the roots of all this in a second. But I think this is a, a, a problemi problematic model because there are many differences between uh, uh, arbitration and litigation. There's, there, there are many differences uh, between a, a judge and an arbitrator. And I dare say um, that the resemblance where they, 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 they meet is only in a very superficial, only in a very surface type of analogy. Um, where, where you say, oh, look, they both, they both adjudicate, if you want to use that word, uh, cases. And there are really, there are many points, but there are 12 foundational propositions that I think really distinguish uh, the two in ways that are uh, extremely meaningful and then also in ways that show that this, this, this diff these differences are so deep that really they cannot be reconciled. But I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the conceptual duality in, in civil law jurisdictions on the issue of arbitrator immunity liability that forms no part of U.S. common law authority on the subject. Uh, the, the U.S. doctrinal scheme on the issue has no vestiges, uh, perhaps to its detriment, it's not clear, of a conceptual contractual theory serving as a normative basis. The jurisprudence on the subject holds fast to the judicial adjudicative role that we were talking about. This firm formulation has led to a doctrinal development providing for absolute immunity to arbitrators indistinguishable from that applicable to judges concerning the performance of their judicial adjudicative roles. To be sure, this conceptual and doctrinal development finds its origins in the English common law, as I, as I suggested. Understandably, it has generated considerable academic debate addressing the relative merits of what has been identified as overprotection. That concern invites comprehensive review. Prior to consideration of the issue, however, the historical origins of the absolute immunity accorded to arbitrators really needs to be discussed with some rigor. And I think that the origin of the absolute theory of arbitrator immunity is really as, as old as the common law itself. Uh, it roots can be, its roots can be traced to judicial immunity. And this is really, the, I think, the, the cause of, of the problem. 
uh, analysis of its normative foundation is even more arcane and linear in its development. The common law absolute judicial immunity, which arbitrators later inherited, is based on a semi-religious principle of monarchical infallibility. In the classical contribution commentaries on the laws of England, Blackstone argues uh, every bit with the passion of a monarchist that, quote, besides the attributes of sovereignty, the law also ascribes to the king in his political capacity, absolute perfection, end of citation. Hence, we encounter the immortal axiom that the king can do no wrong. The principle is even broader still, according to Blackstone, quote, the king, moreover, is not only incapable of doing wrong, but even thinking wrong. He can never mean to do an improper thing. In him is not folly or weakness, end of citation. Central to Blackstone's monarchical infallibility doctrine is the qualification th that this state of perfection is ascribed to the king by the law and only applies to the king in his political capacity. Now, just think about that. Think about it. He's saying the king's infallible. The king can do no wrong. The, the king can't even think to do wrong. But he's only infallible when he's acting in a political capacity, not in a human capacity, not in a personal capacity separating the political as if it were a realm somehow uh, infused with meta human qualities and attributes. Let's keep that in mind. Let's keep that in mind because infallibility presupposes a level of perfection that I dare say we're not capable of seeing. Even in something like geometry, we now have non-Euclidean geometry where parallel lines meet, with, where, where, where perpendicular, uh, with an angle that's perpendicular has more or less, but never 90 degrees. When the sum of the angles in a right triangle is, is more or less, but never 180 degrees. When a circle never, ever, ever has 360 degrees. You understand that? So here we see Blackstone talking about one form of perfection that is, is clearly divine in nature. So this is, I think, is extremely important. And it has more than just academic curiosity attached to it. In this sense, the king's infallibility is comparable in some sense to the qualification of infallibility pronouncements of papal infallibility, which holds that the pope is infallible only as to matters of dogma in very specifically announced circumscribed situations. Consequently, the king's infallibility is very much related to his role as sovereign in the execution of sovereignty. He is otherwise imperfect. This distinction, sovereign in the execution or exercise of sovereignty, matters beyond the value of mere historical premise. Although it appears as a seemingly innocuous subordinate clause in an otherwise spectacular sentence, its influence on US common law's theory of absolute arbitrator immunity will be paramount, albeit only implicit. In fact, it will represent the doctrinal principle with respect to which the theory of absolute arbitrator immunity would be challenged and timidly rendered less than absolute. Certainly, Blackstone's formulation of monarchic infallibility did not altogether monopolize the formation and transformation of the common law, even with respect to the king's presumably perfect governmental workings. Two reasons appear to be paramount. First, Blackstone himself struggled with the dissonance between the proposition of invoking perfection and the less than perfect or wholesome exercise of sovereignty on the part of the monarchy itself. Hence, his effort to square the circle by positing that even an instance where the royal grant of, quote, any franchise or privilege to a subject contrary to reason, close quote, would prove harmful to the commonwealth, the law would presume that third parties and not the king were to be held accountable. 
It's very problematic. Although this proposition carries with it the goal of political expediency in preserving and perpetuating the monarchy, its practical effects on most subjects was not particularly welcomed. Imagine if you have a commercial dispute with the crown, by definition, the crown is always right. And guess what? That means you are always wrong. Second, at least one other writer influential in the development and transformation of the common law who actually preceded Blackstone held a diametrically opposite view on the matter. Henry D. Bracton, in his lapidary opus, De Legibus, De Le Legibus deftly disavowed the axiom that, quote, the king can do no wrong. More so by dint of subtle analogies and metaphors between the monarchy and the divine than pursuant to syllogistic reasoning that may have cost him his life in 13th century England. The parallels between, quote, the blessed parent of God, close quote, and the king as sovereign are subtle and somewhat misleading. The argument is aimed at subordinating the king to laws of men and thereby placing the monarch equidistant as to every subject from the normative strictures of law. The text merits citation. This is what the Bracton wrote. And again, what he's trying to do, he's this guy came about 500 years or 400 years before Blackstone. And what he's trying to say is, you know, the king, we have to, we, the king needs to be controlled. And he writes, quote, the king himself, however, ought not to be under man, but under God and under the law, because the law makes the king. Therefore, the king renders back to the law what the law gives him, namely dominion and power. For if there is no king, where will and not law wield dominion, thus also the blessed parent of God, the Virgin Mary, mother of the Lord, who by a unique privilege was above the law for the sake of giving an example of humility, did not recoil from the following lawful ordinances. The king should act likewise, lest his power remain unbridled. End of citation. Even though the contemporary view is that many hands played a part in the legibus authorship. There is no quibble but that Bracton is responsible for favoring the rule of law as the monarchy's silent and most authoritative and ranking normative principle. In addition to the elegant metaphors and similes to quote the blessed parents of God, end of citation, identifying quote the law as the foundation and origin of the king's authority rather than divine right should not be overlooked or dismissed. The pendulum's shifting doctrinal swing is severe. The identification of man-made law as the foundational normative source of the monarch's authority soon challenged Bracton's and later Blackstone's most emphatic axiom that the king can do no wrong. The axiom publicly was derisively identified in some, some quarters as, quote, a ridiculous perversion. Furthermore, it has been noted that history compellingly established that, quote, the king not only is capable of doing wrong, but is more likely to do wrong than any other man if he is given the chance. End of citation. Bracton preceded Blackstone, as I said, by about 580 years. By the time that Blackstone was writing apologies and commentaries on the king's infallibility, and certainly by 1688, the royal absolutism that the Stuarts claimed substituted parliamentary absolutism. The more general abstraction from the king's infallibility is in effect sovereign immunity. The axiom in modern times, it is more often explained as a rule of social policy, which protects the state against burdensome interference with its performance of its governmental functions and preserves its control over state funds, property, and instrumentalities. The immunity extends well to officers and agencies of the state engaged in carrying on its governmental functions. And a suit against such officer or agency is regarded as one against the state itself." End of citation. So the immunity protecting the king understandably was passed on to the Crown's representatives exercising regulatory and administrative Functions. Now we have a situation where the king's immunity is 
rendered available as as by by really uh legal quasi almost metaphysical fiat to everyone who is concerned with implementing the king's will uh, to the entire court of course foremost in this category were judges obviously indeed as i said before prior to the 1996 arbitration act the uk accorded practically absolute immunity to arbitrators, let alone to judges. English law was held to, out to be a paragon of official and absolute arbitrator immunity prior to the passing of the Arbitration Act of 1996, even though the absolute nature of sovereign immunity, which the United States enjoyed until 1976 with the passage of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, is less uh, less uh, than clear uh, that the English uh, common law gives rise to the U.S. common law on judicial immunity. It is here that the most expansive expression of absolute arbitrator immunity developed and continues to influence doctrinal content in the U.S. common law. Now, I, I want to uh, talk to you a, a little bit about uh, the overprotection aspect, the transposition of judicial immunity to uh, arbitral immunity. And, you know, a lot of, I can save you a lot of time by saying that basically, in, in my opinion, um, this transformation was not a thoughtful one. It was not a deliberate one. It was not uh, the product of discursive reasoning that someone or a group of people, legislators, or judges uh, sat down and said, let's bring judicial immunity um, to arbitrators because uh, of a, a very thoughtful process. No, no, the, the thought that I want to leave you with is that uh, this very serious attribution of immunity, of absolute immunity, is based on a superficial analogy that ultimately is not and cannot be conceptually sustainable. Practically unqualified absolute judicial immunity has been the subject of unqualified incorporation into the sphere of international arbitration. This doctrinal development has matured without the benefit of at least eight non-exhaustive propositions that configured and reconfigured the development and expansion of the absolute judicial immunity stricture. The development in turn gave rise to a cluster of common law related immunities, just like the king and the people surrounding the king. Now, now judicial officers, prosecutors, court reporters, all of these now enjoy absolute judicial immunity, uh, which is commonplace. Uh, thus, the absolute arbitrator immunity rule lacks both the pivotal English and American historical transformational moments, the natural consequences of the doctrine that the king can do no wrong, the social historical vector of a post-Civil War reconstruction U.S. Supreme Court that spawned the absolute judicial immunity doctrine. Uh, the absolute arbitra arbitrator immunity doctrine is not a rightful heir to this historical legacy. Instead, the doctrine was the product of a tour de force having as its cause and first principle and analogy rather than a series of very specific historical moments that focused on the specific workings of judicial tribunals as expressions of institutionalized sovereignty that had to be safeguarded at all costs. No comparable claim can be ascribed to the role of an arbitrator in an international commercial arbitration or treaty-based dispute. Second, the narrow instances giving rise to judicial liability for civil claims based upon an absolute lack of jurisdiction tantamount to, quote, abuse of jurisdiction is both theoretically and practically absent from arbitration proceedings. No such exception to liability can form part of a framework based on party consent and circumscribed by the doctrines of arbitrability and competence competence. In other words, what is actually a problem in the judicial uh, sector that would give rise to an, an, an exception to that very, very strong and comprehensive immunity 
simply is not present in, 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 in an arbitral context. Third, the system of control common to judicial proceedings minimize the need for private civil damages actions as an appropriate check on judicial wrongdoings. Arbitration proceedings lack comparable systems of control and accountability attaching to arbitrator misconduct. Therefore, the use of private causes of action as an appropriate recourse in order to create a chilling effect for arbitrator misconduct and to correct arbitrator abuses is all the more warranted. Fourth, judicial immunity and the derivative cluster of immunities attaching to public sector actors whose responsibilities are essential to the judicial process and equally necessary for purposes of exercising state sovereignty through the judicial administrative regulatory system. They are, the sub, they are subject to systematic hierarchical checks and balances within a structure of agencies. That entire framework is absent uh, from international arbitration and the role of arbitrators. It's just simply not there. Further, such officials forming part of the judicial process are first, uh, uh, under official government scrutiny, and secondly, subject to public record disclosure strictures that render their undertakings susceptible to the public's performance assessments and the consequential effects of such public evaluations. International commercial arbitration is private and ad hoc. Therefore, the need for private rights of action against arbitrators is all the more enhanced. Fifth, the contours of the development and expansion of the judicial immunity doctrine in part were based on an analysis of phases of judicial proceedings that have no analogous arbitration proceedings and typically expose public actors forming part of the judiciary, including judges, magistrates, to an entire universe of non-parties with which arbitrators have no dealings. It follows that judicial officers who are essential to the enforcement of court orders, for example, are accorded the equivalent immunity based upon an expansive construction of that doctrine premised on consideration of these two factors. The enforcement of court orders and judgments habitually concerns or touches upon non-parties and therefore creates greater exposure for judges and other judicial actors who are completely foreign to the arbitral process irrespective of the cry of voices, asserting that arbitral proceedings are self-contained international events, not subject to geopolitical constraints, the fact remains that international commercial arbitration awards are not and cannot be self-executing. Because of these reasons, nature and contribution construction, their efficacy and ultimate practical application are wholly dependent on judicial tribunals. Six, the expansion of the doctrine to non-judges always took place within the context of the rubric and incident historicity of a judicial process. Neither elements of that process nor its historical foundations form part of international commercial arbitration. Thus, the transposition of judicial immunity to arbitrator immunity on the strength only of a surface analogy concerning seemingly shared aspects of adjudication that in fact cannot resist sustained analysis is conceptually flawed and leads to adverse practical workings. The ills of, the Ills of overprotection cannot be policed. These consequences in turn give rise to greater expenses, inefficiencies, material disclosure concerns, and questions per se, per, pertaining to process legitimacy. The necessary to the judicial process standard is completely extrinsic to arbitral proceedings. Two more and that's it. Seventh, the practical consequences of engrafting judicial immunity on international arbitrators leads to a systematic disavowance of the most fundamental and sacrosanct principles that our arbitration purports not only to safeguard, but to further, namely efficiency and expediency. Overprotection arising from absolute immunity causes unforeseen and involuntary cost shifting. As noted, overprotection encourages risk hedging on the part of arbitrators, as well as the proliferation and application of a subjective criterion conducive to a non-disclosure 
an abuse of discretion. Eighth and finally, judicial adjudication is reasonably and carefully constrained. Even the liberal US common law standard of quote, abuse of discretion generates considerable controls over interlocutory and dispositive rulings. These appellate accountability strictures minimize the need for private civil actions as a means to discourage and to control intentional or negligent judicial misconduct. Arbitrators are not susceptible to analogous, let alone identical accountability imperatives. It's just not there. To the contrary, arbitrator discretion is both practically and theoretically absolute. Further, in addition to the unbridled nature of the inherent powers of arbitrator discretion, arbitrators lack appellate recourse. These premises, however, have played no role in qualifying or tempering the unrestricted importation of judicial immunity to arbitration. Let me just share with you that, you know, history teaches that in fact, the king often does wrong by his subjects and perhaps with even greater regularity conceives of wrongdoing. We also learned that as in the post US Civil War Reconstruction era, there was an imperative and certainly one justified by both reason and equity to strengthen the doctrinal foundations of a socially, politically and economically embattled judicial institution whose job it was to save the union and to sail the uncharted waters of implementing the Civil War Reconstruction Amendments. So there are a number of cases that follow, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, civil, the, the Civil War Reconstruction Amendments that expand on, on judicial immunity and, and expand on judicial immunities in ways that are extremely curious. And it, it's my thinking that the reason this occurred was because at that point, the, the judicial institution was, was paramount. Um, the, the Civil War, the post-Civil War period uh, brought such legitimacy challenges to the government, to, to, to the union, that the courts did everything they could to strengthen the integrity of the judicial system. One of these was really elevating the concept of judicial immunity, which again, was taken whole cloth and imported into international arbitration. Uh, race relations were less than clear at the time, even more so than they are today. Um, the configuration of a post-Civil War labor force was a complete unknown. Uh, who would replace the labor of slaves? Uh, was this even possible? The status and conceptual substantive meaning of the term citizen itself raised questions and spawned uncertainties for which there were no answers nor clear pole stars. The only thing that remained and appeared certain was the existential need to have a judicial system with sufficient legitimacy to hold a scarred nation together. Judicial immunity rightfully developed as an absolute doctrine during the period of foundational relativity. A review of the seminal authorities establishes multiple layers of untested assumptions, misguided analyses culminating in a US common law doctrine of absolute arbitrator immunity, indistinguishable from its judicial uh, primogenitor counterpart. Today, the US stands alone in offering absolute immunity to arbitrators. The rest of the world is not wrong. The first such misstep consisted in applying a judicial immunity to arbitrators. The judicial immunity doctrine was transposed to the arbitration space based upon surface arguments only. Seeing clearly towards a separate and distinct arbitrator immunity doctrine becomes all the more complex as a result of the visceral self-judging and intuitive incorporation of incomplete legal reasoning in cases that assumed the existence of an arbitrator partial immunity doctrine having its genesis and its judicial counterpart absolute in nature but separate and distinct from the judicial immunity counterpart. Here's what I leave you with. It's important to revisit what is being taken for granted as just intuitively true, that, that arbitrators, and certainly in the US, uh, merit an absolute uh, immunity approach. 
I think that what's warranted is actually a hybrid approach that looks at them as in part having a, a private function and also having a, a public function. Uh, I said the rest of the world is, is clearly not wrong. Um, even the rest of the world, of course, uh, the, the, is, is a major, major statement that itself needs to be qualified. There are many tangents to um, who's doing what and, and, and to what extent, but we need to take a first step. And I think that first step is being critical towards um, this doctrine. Um, you've been very generous and very gracious with your time. So uh, I wanna thank you for having put up with all that. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Professor. And for this last part of the Q&A, I would like to introduce my colleague, Ms. Jenny Lian, who will be in charge of moderating these last minutes. So as previously announced, please, all of you, feel free to raise your questions or even comments if they do not necessarily need to be questions uh, using the raise hand button, a function at the bottom of your website or simply putting those in the Q&A function that you also have in the Zoom site. So without further ado, uh, Jenny, I, I leave this space to you. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Astrid, and thank you so much, Professor Martinez Fraga. As Astrid mentioned, uh, my name is Jenny Leon, and I'm the president of PIELSA for this year. Uh, so we would like to again thank you so much for speaking on this very interesting topic and to share with others. So uh, we have about 15 minutes. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or type questions in the Q&A box. Okay, maybe people are thinking about questions now. So we previously received um, a question and that's about, um, so Professor, have you seen, could you maybe give, so you gave a very theoretical speech um, in today's lunch talk. Would you please expand on more concrete examples that you've seen in practice um, about the effects of arbitral immunity, especially in the US um, sure. and also, Thank you. Please don't finish it. You said, and also. Sorry, my second question is um, whether you've seen there's a trend in um, Latin America in contrast to Europe, even though they're both civil law traditions. Thank you. Those are, are, are both very good questions. Um, I think one of the things we see uh, that frustrates uh, the consumers of arbitral services is a delay in in the award. Um, arbitration is supposed to be expedient, it's supposed to be efficient, it's supposed to be quick, and, and we see situations where um, an, ar ar an arbitral panel may take a year to, to get an award out. And it seems to me that this is a, a foundational uh, miscarriage or, or mis uh, underperformance, if you will, of what the arbitrators agreed to do, which is to, to form part of a panel and adjudicate the process and to be expeditious. So th that's, that's one, one example. Of course, there are, there are radical examples uh, where we see that uh, there may be a, a type of uh, um, arbitral misconduct in, in being partial to, uh, against one party um, in, in denying a party due process um, so th this too, I think, would be ex extremely problematic. Uh, we also have uh, situations where an arbitrator does not disclose uh, facts from which a reasonable person may infer a conflict of interest. Uh, and those facts may surface later in, in the middle of, of, of the arbitration. Uh, and, and now we have a, a clear disclosure issue, which is extremely problematic to, to the entire process. Uh, we may need a different arbitrator. So in disclosure, we have um, one, one area. A second area we have in the actual performance of a timely performance of the award. And then of course, uh, there, there are attendant partiality issues that uh, I think can be devastating and can ultimately lead beyond the particular arbitration to process legitimacy issues. The second question, uh, do, do I see a difference between Europe and, and Latin America? Um, no, I don't. Uh, I, I really don't. I think uh, I think international arbitration is is, is international, and, and human beings are international, and 
we see a very uh, the same general conduct, uh, professional conduct, um, for better and for worse, almost seamlessly throughout the Americas and Europe, in my opinion, in my experience. Thank you, Professor. Um, we have one question from the participants, so I'm going to unmute uh, Raja Shri. Uh, please feel free to say your question. You're on mute. Yes, hi. Um, good afternoon, Professor Fraga. I hope you remember me. I was a student from NYU, LLM batch of 2016. Um, I, I remember you very well. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Um, it's an honor to have participated in this webinar. Um, I just have one question, Professor. Uh, you spoke about how the need of the hour right now is for a paradigm shift whereby we need to move from the theory of absolute immunity to something of a hybrid. Um, from the practice perspective, how do you think this is going to play out? Um, what, in your opinion, is needed for this transition to happen? Well, I mean, I, I think, I, I think we're, we're seeing the first preliminary steps, uh, which is a consciousness that, that we are practically, not, not completely alone, there are a handful of, of countries that, that have a similar approach, but that we are a, a minority, a very, very serious minority in, in the community of nations taking this approach where the arbitrator is, is seen as tantamount to a, a, a judge. I think the practical consequences are going to be uh, positive for arbitration if we were to have something of a hybrid system that that uh, also uses a contractual, a, a, a contract liability uh, paradigm. Uh, I think arbitrators will be uh, much more thoughtful in, in disclosure issues. I think uh, all of us will be much more thoughtful about being timely and getting awards out. Um, I, I think that when people have uh, to be accountable, uh, I think that will lead to greater efficiencies and, and greater professionalism. So I just see positives coming from this. Um, again, uh, it's, we have to be thoughtful about it. We have to make sure that, that arbitrators are, are safeguarded and that they don't feel that, that they are vulnerable to frivolous lawsuits. Uh, this is extremely important. But absolute immunity uh, for many, you know, the reasons I mentioned are just a handful of those reasons. Uh, we are, we're limited by time and format. But there are many uh, more and deeper reasons for um, making very significant distinctions between an arbitrator and, and a judge and, and therefore uh, the policies that, that attach. Uh, by the way, uh, similarly, I think that in, 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 in penal law, in, in criminal law, arbitrators should not be held to the standards of judges and, and, and uh, uh, civil servants. I think they should be treated uh, less harshly, if you will. Um, the law, in that sense, should be much more forgiving uh, because they are not serving a, a public function, even though I'm, I'm perfectly aware that in ISDS, in investor state arbitration, uh, there's more of a seemingly public function to what arbitrators are doing because of the nature of uh, adjudicating cases involving states and the application of the public international law of investment protection. But thank you. Yes, of course. How can I forget you? I remember you very well. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from the Q&A box from an attendee. Um, so the question is, why do you think arbitrators or practitioners don't like to talk about this? But instead to like to keep this, um, the status quo. On the other hand, do you think that rules of statutory limited um, liability of arbitrators are a good alternative? Um, and I have a similar question as well, and that is what are some um, reform proposals you can propose um, to change the, the status quo? Yeah, well, wh why do people keep the status quo? Well, uh, it, it's a great question. I think because uh, there is no organized uh, pressure to, to, to change. In other words, uh, when you have a judge, the judge is doing what? 
exercising judicial sovereignty through the courts. It's part of a political process. Uh, international commercial arbitration is, is largely private, uh, not public. That's one reason why the status quo remains the status quo. Secondly, uh, so that the responsiveness from a commercial public, from a general public is, is a little bit more complicated, if not altogether impossible. So that, that I think is, is one, one reason. Um, a second reason, it's always very difficult for us to uh, look at ourselves critically. And I put myself in, in that category. I also serve as an arbitrator, even though mostly I am a counsel, a, you know, either claimant or, or a respondent, a, an investor or a state. Uh, but it, it's very difficult for a group to see itself uh, critically and to say, oh, gee, what we really need is instead of having this, uh, enjoying this absolute immunity um, from virtually even intentional torts, uh, we need to be made liable so we can do a better job. As you can see, that's counterintuitive to human nature in some fundamental ways. So I think that's also a, uh, a realistic candid assessment of why you know, there, there isn't change. Uh, what, are, what would be proposals? I think uh, you have limited, uh, limited liability statutory frameworks. I think um, that that's one way of, of approaching this. Um, you can have a standard that shows clear and convincing rather than a preponderance of the evidence. Um, and you can limit this to contractual damages where the damages have to be uh, actually quantified. Um, so there are many ways of making this uh, pretty much something akin to, for example, it could be akin to uh, uh, professional negligent malpractice. Uh, lawyers are, are regulated, um, um, uh, physicians are, are regulated, every single type of professional is regulated, but now an, an arbitrator is not regulated. That doesn't really make any sense. So we have many paradigms to, to choose from because every, seemingly every profession is, is regulated or has a standard uh, with respect to which its actors, stakeholders are held accountable. We don't have that, and, and, and we should have it. Here's why we should have it, because it's gotten to the point where arbitration has taken too long, uh, proceedings take too long, proceedings are too expensive. Uh, the, the, uh, the expectations of the consumers of arbitral services at sophisticated levels are not being met. So this is leading to, to a, a a, a rejection of, of arbitration that really need not be present it's, it, because it can be controlled. How can it be controlled uh, by having professionals act professionally and be accountable? Lack of accountability, absolute lack of accountability has never shown itself to be um, um, a proponent of efficiency. Thank you, Professor. That's very helpful. We have um, perhaps time for one last question. Pablo, I will allow you to talk. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Martinez. I, I actually made the, the previous question and I wanted to. My name is Pablo Mori, by the way, I'm from Peru and I work in, in DC, Washington, DC. And I wanted to make a sort of a follow up question uh, on the previous one. Uh, this week or last week, uh, a sentence in the in the highest paying court was rendered, where uh, according to the facts of the of the decision, this arbitrator had been acting also as a party uh, counsel in a different case. So he was um, the decision was against the arbitrator, saying that he was liable uh, because he was acting with uh, negligence. But my point is. Uh, assuming that the facts of this case are true, he was uh, the decision was for him to, to to pay damages on the amount of three hundred thousand euros, but according to the case, his fees were almost eight hundred thousand euros. So at the end, if if you have those numbers, uh, the, the arbitrator ends up winning. So it's not really a disincentivizing decision. So what do we do, my question would be, what do we do in order to really disincentivize this kind of behavior uh, with liability uh, rules? 
Thank you very much. No, thank you, Pablo, if I may. Uh, well, you know, the, the case you're citing to, the, the facts are a little bit sketchy, so I, I really can't speak to the, that case. Um, I, don't, I don't know what you really mean by, you know, that he was uh, an arbitrator in one case and, uh, you know, counsel in another case, if it were they related cases, et cetera. So I, so I, don't, I don't know the facts of that case. Clearly, uh, a result where the net is a $500,000 payment for arbitral services, which, by the way, is uh, fairly generous by, by any or euro. Uh, it, it's generous by any metric anywhere in the world. Um, that's a, 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 a obviously a very bad result. I think if you have general rules of liability, of causation liability and contractual liability, that should be enough. If arbitrators know that you know they have to perform their obligations as as contemplated and expected by the parties, uh, then this is this is very important. I think this 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 is this is very good. If arbitrators know that um, their fees can be uh, uh, can be uh, placed in jeopardy because of underperformance or non-performance, I think this is also very important. It's not. It cannot be justified for an arbitral panel to take six months or a year in getting an award out. Uh, that's just that's just not not right. If if you can't, if you're too busy to take the case. You have a moral obligation not to take the case, uh, but but you can't take the case and have it meet your personal schedule to the detriment of the very process that you're purportedly serving. That that makes absolutely no sense, and and that just shouldn't be the case. But in, in spe as, as a direct and specific answer, or attempt to answer your question, I think uh, rules of 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 liability of, of tort liability, rules of contractual liability. Uh, the tort liability more so perhaps on in understanding some of the damages uh, but but i think the rules of, of contract liability tort liability uh will help and 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 will will be uh extremely extremely productive and contributing to, to a better system we just can't have a, a situation where there's zero accountability and one class of professional decision maker if you will uh that that is uh that is self-judging. That that makes absolutely no sense. Thank you, Pablo, and thank you to all the participants. We're um, perfectly on time by the hour. On behalf of Piles, I would like to thank Professor Martinez Private again for your very you. interesting and unique perspectives, and thanks everyone for participating in our lunch talk. Um, yeah. Have a great day, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. It's been a privilege. Bye. Thank you, Professor.